Boom. Yeah. And we're live. There we are. Here with author Violet Fenn. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it on All Hallows Eve. Thank you for taking the time. I'm sure you have a lot lined up for tonight. Um, do you know what? I spend? I do Halloween quietly because our family, we, we go for the old version of it, you know, when we do it quietly. And I've got a lot of friends in Whitby this weekend and I'm so jealous, but I'm happy enough. I'm at home. I'm sorting. I'm doing some writing and, you know, I'm just having a nice time with the kids. So it's cool. So are you expecting trick or treaters? We do. We do. It seems to be it's always been a, a lesser thing, in you know, in the UK. Okay. So you, you, some, you don't really get it as much as I know you do in the States and we don't decorate as much and whatever. And, and I think that's partly possibly because it's just so, as old as time here. Do you know what I mean? So we're just yeah. used to it. Um, so, yeah, no, we do, though. And I, we always have sweets in and, you know, although they get past a certain age and they'd rather have a bit of cash. So you know it, it depends which sort of turn up but we've got the tweets we've got the pumpkins we're cool we're, we're down with it i heard jane fonda in an interview one time she talked about how much she really appreciated the way they celebrate in mexico just you know taking fireworks and alcohol to the graveyard and really embracing death and what it has to bring to you yeah and and that's i suppose that's more um the the real thing behind it you know and and you've got the cinco de mayo and all that sort of thing and so they have got the real traditions as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's their cultural thing, whereas a lot of the rest of us, I mean, I've, I would always have described myself as a pagan anyway, so I'm, I'm interested in it from that perspective. But a lot of people's, you know, it, it's a novelty, isn't it, Halloween? So it's nice. It's nice when people do it properly, you know, and, and respect the old traditions and do all that. So, yeah, no, I'd love to be in Mexico for something like that. That would be amazing. So now at this point, are you kind of pigeonholed into being a vampire on Halloween? I think I've been pigeonholed for years. So <laughs> this isn't a, this isn't a new thing for me um, because, you know, I've, I've been interested in it for a long time. I've written about death for a long time. I used to run a website that collected postmortem photography, um, the old Victorian stuff, you know, when people, they would dress the dead up and make them look alive and dress them in the best clothes so, so um, them, right? and, and yeah and I ended up with a website that was one of the biggest in the world I never owned the the photos um I just I, I collated them online because I realized that a lot of these photos were they were turning up on things like crack.com you know and and for the just for the horror factor and I realized that actually these were beautiful photographs so I started just collating them in, into a website um called the skull illusion and it's still got um quite a busy facebook page although i'm terrible i haven't updated it for a long time um and yeah and that ended up being massive so people knew me as the sort of death woman you know <laughs> from from a long time ago and so and you know and i'm a terminal goth so it, it, it this isn't a surprise this is this is just my day job all year round you know so it's just what i am so would you say you've been interested in photography as long as you have writing certain types certain types of photography i am a terrible photographer um i can take pictures because i've got a very fancy iphone that can do it for me you know but without that i can't do it um so i admire anyone that can really get into the technology and get really good photos but um i'm fascinated by because my era sort of specialized era is sort of 17 1800s and, and a little bit nearer than that so yeah. sort of 150 years from late 1700s to early 1900s so photography was becoming a big thing then you know it was the development of photography I don't think the word even existed until the 1830s it was a German chap I think came up with the, with the name photography um, so the actual development of it does cover an awful lot of the time period that I write about um, and and the fact that they started doing trick photography and spirit photography and everything almost straight away i mean they're clever yeah. the people the people who had these cameras they're not daft they knew what they were doing from the start so that that photography fascinates me yeah yeah definitely oh yeah and, and you talked about before i mean even just the invention of print i mean we think now of you know all this clickbait on social media and things like that and you know in the invention of print you still had to be someone who drew eyes to your newspaper and you would write sensational things and like you said take sensational photographs so yeah that is really something to think about that's that's very true yeah and yeah and and this sort of media clickbait thing happened really really quickly um 
because the mass media was only sort of coming into itself well as early as the 1700s you know when you're starting to get newspapers regular newspapers have been daily ones since before that um occasional ones but then you've got things like and then i cover this in my book you've got things like serbian vampires um in the uh, early 1800s i can't remember the exact dates um i'm terrible i've got it written down somewhere <laughs> um and um no it's in the 1700s anyway johan flickinger um in Serbia was sent to go and supervise all of the supposed vampire burials. Yeah. Um, and it ended up in newspapers. And what you can find if you go back through, I belong to all the archives and things. So if you go back through the archives, um, newspapers would then reprint it with slight salient details changed. So it then looked like it was a new vampire story. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got your, your sort of clickbait stories in the 1700s, 1800s, you know, because they knew so people, it would make people buy the paper. So, yeah, it, it, it is a really um, old thing. You know, click, clickbaits existed as long as papers have existed. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to think about, too. And now those were those the bodies with the purge fluid in Serbia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So people looking at them, because obviously this is in the era before real scientific medical knowledge sort of thing. Yeah. So they would um, uh, open up these graves of people who were just just villagers and, you know, but they thought they were get, climbing out of their grave to avenge themselves against their neighbours or whatever. And um, what they'd find what looked like a fairly sort of bloated corpse with what looked like perhaps blood coming from its mouth. And mm -hmm. um but it, what we know now is that's just part of the stages of decomposition. So in decomp, you know, the body and, and also it depends on how they're buried and, you know, whether it's sealed and whatever. So it can swell up and the purge fluid breaks down. It's just your internals. It's pretty grim. It's just your internals breaking down and seeps out of orifices, as glamorous <laughs> as that sounds. Um, and of course, it'll come out of their mouth. So it looks like they're it looks like they're lying there fully fed with a bit of blood dripping out of their mouth, but actually the poor things are just rotting from the inside out, you know, mm. but quite a fright. I'd imagine if you unearthed one and found one looking like that. Now I want to put a flag in that because there is speaking of rotting from the inside out. I hate to give you that image, but I do want to come back to that way later in the show. Yeah. So you'll see where I connect that. Um, but we were just talking about all of that is in your latest book, a history of the vampire and popular culture. Love at first bite. So when it comes to writing, when it comes to first being interested in that, I've heard in, in a separate interview that you did, I think it was with Jessica and certainly with the Messy podcast about a year ago, that you've basically been considered yourself a writer since childhood, correct? Yes, I've always written. I've always, always written. It's not what I've always done. Um, I've done a bit of everything, but it, it is what I've mostly done. And it's the only thing that I've ever done as a sort of professional career. I've had jobs before. I've worked in bars and I did a bit of music promotion for a bit, but my only real sort of career has been writing. I've written from the start. I started with writing a music fanzine in my twenties, you know, um, just because I fancied doing it. And I do most things like that. If I fancy having to go at it, I'll give it a go. Um, but yeah, no, no, since a kid, when I, as I was growing up, um, I've got a slightly younger brother who actually lives in Italy, but he writes books as well. He writes um, books for speakers of English as a second language. Okay. He's an English teacher in Italy and he writes these amazing biographies that are harder than you think because he's got to simplify it to things like Ernest Hemingway, the Beatles, Rolling Stones. He's, he does all these amazing characters, but he has to simplify it into language that people will understand if they've got English as a second language. So um, we've That's played. Really hard. Yeah. And it's it, it, about it, sacred cows. I mean, it, wow. Yeah. So not only has he got to pick these subjects that he absolutely loves, He's got to talk about, and then he has to ask questions at the end of chapters because it's meant to test, test people's understanding. Um, so, so it's we both do it. It's just me and my brother, and we both write, and um, we've clearly just always had that in the family. You know, my my dad, he, he died a few years ago, but he always kept books. He'd go and buy secondhand books, and it wouldn't matter if it was relevant to anything. It didn't matter if he was particularly interested in it. He just liked going and collecting secondhand books and having a look through it. So, uh, so it's always been there. Um, and I guess it just, I'm otherwise unemployable, I think, because I don't put up with people's bullshit very much. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just not, I'm, and I'm autistic as well. And um, 
it, it most people don't realize this because um what they would have called high function is terrible description um but so i cover it all up by learning things and you know and reading things and just finding subjects fascinating so in some ways that's been a bit of a superpower because i am unemployable as anything else so i've had to make this work <laughs> um and also it's the one way i get to stay at home and do what i want to do you know if i want to sit tonight and watch the, the entire series of true blood i can do it because i can justify it. it's research do you know what wow. i mean um and i think yeah i just i was just determined to turn life into something that i enjoyed rather than just a job you know just a job and then time off i ha I, i've got to enjoy what i'm doing otherwise i just can't do it so yeah but going back see this is my other thing as well i just start talking and i don't stop um it makes for a great podcast guys, <laughs> I, I would yeah i suppose yeah that you'd have to it's difficult different when it's live stream because people just got to listen to it when it's uh recorded it's easier for them because they can cut bits out and just bring it back in but um but to go back to the original question i always keep having to pull myself back yeah i've always written i've always liked making things up i've always liked finding out about things um and i've always always liked vampires and old horror so that really is where that came from yeah and i want to get into you know how and why you got into that stuff but first i have to know you really enjoy true blood yes i do but true blood yeah absolutely i'd be the first to admit i watched the first series loved the first series wow. started losing it a bit after that okay right um i it, i'd read the books first and the books are not the way that the tv series came out the books are more they're pretty sharp at times and they can be quite graphic but they are more um easy reading fun vampire book you know and and then it got um, I, I think amazingly um, translated onto a TV screen um, and, and I love it. Yeah. But I'd be the first to admit because people assume that you've watched everything, you love everything, you know, you, you're an expert on all of the things. No, absolutely not. Because there's so many vampires. Yeah. You know, there's so many vampires or versions of vampires. Haven't even watched all of the versions of Dracula because nobody could. I'm sure I've watched <laughs> most of them, but yeah, and people always say to me, the other one is, say, oh, you must love Buffy. I never got into Buffy. Right. Um, I'm the wrong age for it, I think. I'm I'm in my early 50s. So I was probably a bit old and sort of um, working and kids and whatever by the time that was really big. Um, so I, I know it, you know, I watch, I've watch. i watched it because I had to for, for the book and I knew some of it from cultural references. But some of the obvious ones, no, I, d I don't get at all. But yeah, True Blood. Why? Do you not like True Blood? It, it got to the point where, so my wife enjoyed it and I yeah. would watch a few episodes with her and it got to the point where it hooked me because it was so preposterous. I just had to know where the next episode was going. Yeah. <laughs> that's what got me. I, th I think that's the thing. And I think that's when I dropped it because it started getting even more ridiculous and I dropped it. But actually, I think if I'd had the attention span to sit <laughs> and watch it, it probably would have pulled me back in. I have actually got the whole thing on DVD. So maybe, maybe I will spend this evening. And if I hate it, it's your fault, Dylan. <laughs> oh, no. Don't put that on me. <laughs> if you so, waste a minute of my life. The the inspiration for the ghouls and goblins and the dark side of things, from what I understand, your father used to put on some late night horror films that you would watch, yes? It was like a whole channel? Yeah, yeah. no, no, because this is Britain in the 70s and 80s. No, we, our TV went off at midnight. Okay. I don't know how much you know about... Uh, you're probably not old enough and you're in the wrong country, but British TV <laughs> is a weird beast because up until frighteningly recently, the, we only had about four channels anyway. In fact, when I was growing up, you had two um, and then three, three maybe by, the, by this point. Um, but they would stop overnight. So they stopped about midnight, one o'clock in the morning, maybe. And then they played the national anthem. And you were supposed oh. to listen to the national anthem. Um, but late at night, B the BBC used to show the old Universal horror movies. So the old Creature from the Black Lagoon and The Mummy's Hand and uh, Universal and Hammer and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And yeah, and, my, and we got a videotape recorder, an old VHS um, by this point. This would have been early to mid 80s. Um, and that was like dark magic, you know, because suddenly we could record things and we could watch them. And somewhere I've still got a box of really old VHS with it written on the side, you know, where I've written what's on it. 
Um, so yeah, it came from watching um, things like The Mummy's Hand and The Bride of Dr uh, Frankenstein, you know, and, and Dracula's Risen from the Grave and all that sort of thing. Um, and he'd record them overnight and then me and my brother would sit and watch them the next morning. So when other people were getting into real sort of pop stuff, me and my brother were watching these black and white horror movies, which <laughs> makes it sound far cooler than we ever actually were. We're total geeks, a pair of us. <laughs> to this day but we did have some cool habits um but yeah that's no that's where it comes from from my dad being encouraging he just knew i quite liked it okay. so he, he would record it and then we would watch it and then i just got terrifyingly into it really that's quite a system with the tv there we're going to cut you off and then the first thing you're going to see is the national anthem i did that for a very very long time yeah and we um our TV didn't go all night until I was well, well into adulthood. I probably had my kids and everything before we got 24-7 TV in this country. We, I grew up with three channels probably by the time I was school age, and then four came along when I was in my teens, four and five. And, and oh, it's gone really – look, I've gone, I've gone spooky because the sun's gone in. Ah. Um, and, um, yeah, and it used to – and the BBC ones had this thing where when they finished at night and it was called Close Down and it would close down at night and then you'd get the National Anthem played. And some older people would actually stand up for the National Anthem, yeah, you know, in the middle of the night as the telly's finished. It's it's a very weird British thing, that is. You have to be a certain age from a certain place to to know that, know the weirdness of the National Anthem. But, yeah, 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 we, we used to have our TV turned off. Yeah, there's there's certain generations of certain nationalities that we're just never going to know the connection <laughs> to patriotism. We'll just never know. No, 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 no. It, <laughs> it, it's a niche thing. It's a niche thing. But yeah, yeah. So I was lucky that my dad would record things for me. Like I said, and this is why getting videotapes really was a massive big deal because you could watch what you wanted. Yeah. We By this point, we had video stores. Um, you could go and get higher tapes but it was very strict on what you could watch. So even then, I mean, the, even the hammer would have been way above my age range if I'd have tried <laughs> to go and hire, hire it. Um, so being able to record them was a massive eye opener, you know, and I could watch, this is where I saw Christopher Lee, you know, and, and that was like the biggest awakening ever. Christopher Lee as Dracula. I mean, you know, it's no wonder every boyfriend since has fallen short there, hasn't he, you know? <laughs> I want to ask you about that too. We're going to get into that. Okay. Uh, but I tell this story all the time. So I'm sure people who know me are sick of hearing it. But my dad used to set up our camcorder in front of the TV whenever it was playing something that we wanted to record. So he would put a blank tape in the camcorder and just record it in front of the TV. So oh, we all had, actually, to, be, we all had to be very quiet. Me. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. He's actually recording the TV screen itself. Yeah. So we have a land before time tape that during the middle of it, if you listen carefully, you can hear my mom talking to my aunt in the kitchen. That's amazing. And now, see, we did do that because most people my age and even a bit younger will remember that when we had um, the charts, the music charts used to be on on a, on a Sunday night for a long time. So everybody around my age can remember sitting with a tape recorder. And you'd have to shush everybody because you knew the one that you wanted to record would be coming on soon. So you'd be in front of it with your tape recorder. And <laughs> and I, I, I've got so many tapes with me shriek, shrieking at somebody because they've walked in in the middle of the damned or something. They were just on, you know, and I and I loved the damned so much. And they, so I I try and record everything they were on. And, yeah, somebody's walking into the room. So, yeah, we, we did the same. But we went as upmarket. We had, a, we had an audio recorder. <laughs> But we didn't do camcorders, so your dad was ahead of his time. Yeah, big old put it on his shoulder type <laughs> thing. Yeah. So when you were younger, was there a particular moment, like, say, an essay you turned in or an award you got that you were like, I can do this for a living? No, I did precisely the opposite of all that. I didn't do anything that I was supposed to do at school. I was a terrible student that everybody expected a huge amount of because... I was clearly intelligent, but yeah. they couldn't figure out. But I would just wouldn't do it. Um, I didn't get diagnosed with autistic until I was 46. So that explained an awful lot of why I just couldn't fit in at school. Um, I loved doing it. And the teachers could see talent. And I always wish I could go back and find Mrs. Worthington and apologize. Because when I was in, um, it would be what you'd call seventh grade, I would imagine. Um, so I was about 11, 12. And she asked me to enter a writing competition, 
and she was so convinced that I, I could win this writing competition and all I had to do was write a short essay and I never did it um and I put it off and I put it off same as I do now I'm forever doing I, when I've got a deadline I'm doing everything crying at two in the morning even though I've mm -hmm. had six months to do it you know oh, um yeah. and yeah everyone knows that one and um <laughs> So I, she kept badgering me and find, to ask when I, you know, what had happened and had I won this essay competition. And I'd never even set one in. So um, I told my parents, and amazingly for once, they backed me up. And I said to her that um, I'd sent it, but I hadn't heard anything. And presumably I hadn't got anywhere in, the, in this competition. And she was gutted, this poor teacher, because she'd been encouraging me and she thought I should have won and she was so indignant. So Mrs. Worthington, I'm assuming she was younger than I thought she was, so she's probably still alive. Um, I am really sorry. I never sent it in. I, I never did it and I lied <laughs> and I'm sorry. So no, no, I didn't. I literally did it for the hell of it, writing. You know, I didn't, I didn't write endless stories at home. I always had them in my head, but I didn't write them. Um, I, I just had it in the back of my head that that's not what you did. You had to get a job. Um, but I never managed to settle at a job, so it just didn't happen. And then eventually, I, I, I've only written professionally for my full-time living since I was 44. Okay. Um, before that, I went through, I made um, art dolls for a while, mm. really intricate dolls. Um, I did that. I've always done creative stuff. But the actual writing, no, I um, started the Skull Illusion website, which was the post-mortem site, and that was the first proper website I had. Um, and that was in 2011, I think. So this is only 10 years ago. Um, and that got really popular, um, but it got hacked. There was um, foreign hackers took the website down. It was massively busy, the website. And I think they thought it probably had credit card details or whatever, and it was probably worth hacking. It wasn't. It had nothing. It was just me. But the whole thing got full of malware and I had to close it down. So at that point, I started a blog like so many people did and just started writing, writing a blog um, and then got picked up by Metro. This is Metro UK okay. um, and did, started freelancing for them. And I ended up writing a lot for them for about three years. Um, but that's more tabloid journalism type stuff tab yeah. and entertainment things. Yeah. Um, so I did that for three years. And, and like most things, I just sort of fell into it and, and they they I, they knew me through a friend that was already writing for them so they asked me to to send some ideas in and they took me on and then my history publishers because the vampires is the second of my history books and i've got a third out next year they found me through metro i metro had commissioned me to write a piece about victorian sexuality um and i got a message on twitter from an editor saying, you know, would you like to write a whole book about this? Which is not what normally happens to people. So, and, and I wasn't sure that was real, but it was. Um, and that's where it went for. So I've just fallen into everything. I've just fallen into everything. Nothing was intentional. I've just done what turns up in front of me. But it's always been creative because I can't do anything else. Did you end up having to do a lot of those list type of articles for Metro? Like 10 reasons your vampire has to bite your neck type of thing? Yeah, 10 reasons your boyfriend cheese is better than your boyfriend, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Although I did do really well out of gin because I, I got into the habit of writing a top 20 gin list or whatever. So an awful ah. lot of gin so a lot of gin companies sent me bottles of gin. So that was that was pretty cool. Um and, and at that point I, I was writing a bit of everything. You know, I was doing some entertainment stuff. So I I went to, you know, I'd go to press screenings for TV shows and write about that. Um and I specialized a lot in the weirder side of sexuality and things like that because they realized quite early on that I would talk about it and other people perhaps wouldn't gotcha. so and and because I've got zero filters and I'm not embarrassed about very much so um so I, I got into the habit of doing that and that's where the history of Victorian sexuality came from and I wrote a series for them we did Egyptians we did Victorians um the swinging 60s all this sort of stuff and then um yeah, and, and and then my current history publishers, Pen and Sword, got in touch and said they were doing a series of sex and sexuality in different eras. And and did I fancy doing the Victorians one? Let me see if that there we go. I can you can see me again. Um, um and and did I fancy doing the Victorians one? So I did that and then they asked what I'd like to do next, and I pitched the vampires, and that was entirely my idea because I'd always wanted to write that book. So 
I, I just thought I'd take the opportunity and ask them and, and they went for it and they've been they've been brilliant. You know, they properly engaged with it. They've been really good um, and it's doing well for them. So, yeah, I'm pleased. But yeah, in order to spiral around to the beginning question again, because this is what we have to do when it's me. Um, no, I've never done anything intentionally. I have never, I am not one of these ones that's grown up with knowing this is what I want to be. I just fall into everything, basically. Now, uh, tell me about this little bit. I keep reading that you were turned down from a, a job as a mortician. Yeah. What's that yeah, about? That is legit. Absolutely legit. So... I always fancied the one job I've always really fancied doing um, is undertaking funeral directors. I've always fancied doing it for not for morbid reasons. Weirdly, people assume it's for a morbid reason. It's not. It's because I think people don't talk enough about death. And I learned this from doing the Skull Illusion website um, that people loved it because I was talking openly about death. Um, so. I, I really got into that and really enjoyed the fact that I could open up this subject to people that perhaps wouldn't talk about it. Um, and I suddenly thought, well, I could I could work in this, you know. And I, and from my perspective, I thought I'm somebody a little bit different that might might suit the modern undertaking industry because they are getting more. There's more women doing it. There's more people with tattoos and you know different looks. Um, and I find that far more um, inclusive. So a job, I just happened to be looking on a job website. Actually, I was looking for my eldest son at that point, And a job came up as a trainee undertaker. And he'd love to do it. He's always wanted to do it as well. And he'd love to do it. But they needed a driving license and he can't drive. So I said, well, right, for the hell of it, I'm going to apply. Because it turned out to be at the end of my road as well. Um, so it was part time, end of my road. It was the absolute dream job. You'd think I've got the background for it. You know, I knew my stuff. I'm I know that I can talk about stuff without getting embarrassed. I went through all the interview process and I, I was really excited about it because it was a it was an almost entirely women or entirely female run company. It's a franchise, but a company. Um, really excited, got through the whole thing. They said I'd had a really good interview and I and then I got told I was going to the last two and then I heard nothing. And I thought, well, this is weird because they can't find another person that knows more about death than I do and is keener. So I rang their head office <laughs> to be told that they thought I was weird. That was their that was their response. They thought I was weird. Um, <laughs> at the time, they, they actually they thought my interest in death was weird. That, oh, they, okay. they specifically said it. And at the time I was running um, a death cafe, you know, when you go and sit around and chat and it's becoming a big thing where you can go and sit and chat openly about death. And I was running a death cafe and they had discovered this. I had actually written it in my initial application, but they hadn't, they'd only just discovered it somehow. And they said it was a conflict of interest. So I'm not quite sure how me running um, a, a free meetup for people who want to chat about mortality. Um, but I think, I, I don't know. I think sometimes that industry, not so much now, they're getting much better can be quite narrow it's expected to be very solemn very straight very you know old chaps in their suits and their top hats yeah um and some of i mean i'm lucky in that i know some morticians and other people in the in the death industry um across the country and several of them have said well we'd have employed you like a shot you know because you'd have fitted in but i live in a middle class semi rural town yeah that perhaps isn't quite as forward thinking um so maybe i'm just in the wrong place but yeah i got turned down for for an undertaker's job for being too interested in death that is that is something you should definitely put on as you do every page from now on i mean my it's goodness everything it's on every cv it's on absolutely everything yeah because i i you know what i'm going to crow about that for the rest of my life oh absolutely so we talked about your um, your interest in, you know what, I want to save that for later, actually. I want to get this out of the way first. Go on. So uh, when I knew I was going to talk to you, mm -hmm. I got a hold of my sister and I asked her to ask her kids if they had any questions about vampires. Mm -hmm. So I have here seven questions from the kids about awesome. vampires. Awesome. So the first one, why don't vampires stay up in the daytime? Some of them can some of them can that's the thing right i'm going to try and keep this reply on kid and level so you can just <laughs> tell them that right 
So basically, some vampires can. It depends who invented the vampire. Okay. It depends who wrote the vampire. Dracula can get up in the daytime, but he's weaker. Dracula doesn't have to go to bed at night. Other vampires just fall asleep wherever they are, and if they're walking down the street, they'd keel over. Some will turn <laughs> to dust and some won't. But some vampires can stay up in the daytime. Okay. Thank you. Next one is, why do you melt in the sun? They don't. There's another one. There's <laughs> another redundant one. there, yeah. Yeah, they don't. And it's worth showing them the death scene from Nosferatu, because okay. it's not too scary, Nosferatu. You're, you're a little bit careful with it, but <laughs> it's not It's not too scary. And if anyone's seen it, he does the full, ah, uh, you know, in, in, in the sunlight at the end, and he collapses and disappears into a puff of smoke. That is the first time that's done where a vampire is, is killed or whatever in the sunlight. And the whole reason for that, the whole sunlight thing, is because F.W. Murnau, um, a German film director, wanted to make Dracula in the 1920s and wasn't given permission to do it. So he changed the name, changed some of the details and redid the Dracula story, but he called it Nosferatu. Um, so he had to change some details so it wouldn't look like Dracula and he wouldn't get sued. That might have actually answered my follow-up question, which is why Nosferatu has the, the two front fangs instead of the canines. Yeah, a, a lot of vampire tropes that we know now come from Nosferatu, and it's okay. all in, that's all entirely from Murnau changing the details in the hope he did get sued and he did go bankrupt, so it didn't work. But... Um, but actually, no, that is an interesting one. And, and, you know, good on whoever came up with that question because all vampires have got different teeth. We think oh, these are going to be your vampire teeth. Yeah. First of all, they're not. Very, very few vampires have got these, our incisors as their vampire teeth. Um, Nosferatu's got the two middle ones, so yeah. he's got, like little rat teeth. Um, um, Dracula himself doesn't say in Dracula that he's got fangs. It says he's got sharp incisors. Um, but that's it. Um, so all vampire teeth are more or less different. The ones that we would consider classic fangs, which I think from memory, I, I should know this by now, but from memory, I think it's the ones inside the incisors, the next ones in. They have those ones are lengthened, and that is the Lost Boys and True Blood, actually, I think, do that. Um, and those are the ones that will look more like what we consider vampires and what we do in the shadows are more like that as well um in film and, and tv so but all vampire fangs are different twilight and this is this is an ongoing ongoing bugbear of mine don't have fangs at all they've got human teeth yeah i um, saw you put a picture of that on your uh, page one time the different fangs and look at twilight yeah, <laughs> yeah. so you can see they've all got different fangs we expect it to be our own sizes and it's not which makes sense because if you think about it they're too far apart you wouldn't be able to do a lot with those. I never I never thought I'd see the day when I'm sitting on a live feed showing my teeth to the camera. Um, so normally it's the next ones in, but not all have got those. Like, like as you know, Nosferatu's got the, the middle ones. Um, Dracula doesn't have them at all. He's just got sharp teeth. Um, the Twilight vampires have got what they call razor, uh, what are described as razor sharp edges to their teeth. Okay. So how they eat neatly i do not know and how he doesn't bite her face off at some point by accident but um yeah and and so so yeah it, it it's changed because uh, in order to differentiate it from dracula is the reason next one we have is why in the world do you have to wear a cape you don't have to wear a cape and you probably shouldn't wear a cape because if you've seen um oh what's the film um no capes. Edna Mode. What's she in? Um, what's the What's the film that Edna Mode is in? Edna Mode. The, the family. The family of the superheroes. The mum, the dad. We're not talking about Dark Shadows. No, no kids <laughs> program. I haven't got my phone to look it up. It's a It's a kids film with the um. I want to call it the Indestructibles. Um. Oh yeah, the Incredibles. The Incredibles. Okay. The Incredibles. Right. We've gone off topic slightly, but The Incredibles <laughs> is a really good reason why you shouldn't have a, a cape. Edna Moe tells you no capes because they get caught on things and you, you get caught. Um, I strongly suspect capes are a trope that come originally from the first Dracula book where you would have worn a cape in, in the area, in the Carpathians or whatever. You're likely to have worn a cape at the time. It would have just been fashionable. Also, it is incredibly elegant. 
you know, if you, if you notice, it's mostly the men that have got their very beautiful capes. Christopher Lee wouldn't have looked half as sexy, you know, if he was just walking around in a suit, would he? <laughs> he he's got to be able to swoop. So, and it, and also it it references bats and flying, and you know you could almost imagine them maybe being able to fly with their cloaks. So, then no, you don't need to have a cape. No, no capes. Well, there you go. Uh, next one. Why do you got to drink people's blood? It's kind of gross. It is gross. I totally agree. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Um, you don't actually. That again that's another thing that there's a different take on it for different things so um most do um, most most of your vampires do drink blood and it is just where they get nutrition because obviously that is where you would get most nutrition from from a human body it's it's got your iron it's got your nutrients it's proteins all that sort of thing it also would be far it's far easier to nip someone's neck and drink their blood than it is to carve them up and cook them on a barbecue and eat them that way and get the nutrition that way so you can see why. Um, again, uh, this is this is actually that's a really interesting one because yeah, I love when kids ask things because it's just straightforward <laughs> stuff. But then they're not interested in the Freudian subtext. They just want to know the basics, and it's great. So um, part of it is from historical stuff. People assumed that um, quite often in sort of spates of TB consumption, that sort of thing, hmm. people would weaken slowly and then. Other members of the family would weaken after them. The Mercy Brown New England vampire panic incident, that, that was um, TB with the family dying slowly. And the last one was considered to have presumably been feeding off the other ones. So I suppose it's come from a literal interpretation of how would they feed? Maybe they would suck their blood. And also, although it's more of an adult explanation, for, not for kids, you go back as far as incubus, succubus and biblical and historical figures and, and a lot of them, it's to do with you're getting into sexuality and bodily fluids and all that sort of thing. So you can go for the highly psychological intellectual thing or you can go for the it's just the easiest way. And also don't forget that not all of them do it. Um, the, the most well-known current example would be Colin Robinson from what we do in the shadows, okay. who who is um, a psychic vampire and sucks the life force actually he basically bores people to death <laughs> it's it's what he does he bores or irritates people to death and he and it drains them and then they die i think we all know but someone like that we all and that's why it was such a genius move because everybody knows you know an, an emotional vampire i've dated some of them for god's sake um so it's so yeah it it, it isn't it's all to do with life force there's some some just don't. They can just exist by feeding off the energy of other people. But mm -hmm. as for the blood thing, probably just because it's easiest. Well, perfect. And you actually answered the last two questions right in that answer. So wrap it right up. <laughs> and I'm going to give it just a second so that they can watch this and end the video right here so that I can ask my question now. Right. Okay. So my question has to do with one of your YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. You asked how vampire penises work, and I thought that that was very interesting because how do you get a hard on without any blood flow? Oh my god! Don't right. I have actually done. You're you're getting you're getting a bit ahead of me here because I've actually done my first podcast I recorded this morning. It's going to go out this weekend, and it's talking about the mystery of the sparkle peen. <laughs> so you can have an exclusive here um, because I'll I won't put mine out till tomorrow now. So basically. I don't know is is the, the thing. People are a bit coy about it, which is why it fascinates me. Because as soon as somebody's coy about things and don't want to talk about it, that's it. That's all I want to know about. Vampires are, as we all know, the reason we like them is because they're sexy and they're hot, you know, or they're scary and people get off and being scared. You know, it, it's all that sort of stuff. But also it is quite psychologically sort of Freudian. Um I, I, I talked to a psychologist for the book and it, it, it's not difficult to, to draw the thing of sort of the sexual, the penetration of the neck, you know, the sharp teeth and, and soft necks and all this sort of thing. But in so in some vampires, that is all they're after. That is their thrill. So you've got quite a lot of them where you'll see that the 
poor female victim, because it is generally female, especially with the older ones that I love, it's quite most often women. Um, they're swooning, but you can tell they're they're kind of enjoying their swooning as well. You know, that I mean to be fair, if I was going to get eaten alive and it was Christopher Lee in his heyday, I'd probably I mean I'd swoon, but I probably wouldn't fight him off too much. Um so you keep talking all this Christopher Lee talk, you're gonna make Dave Vanian jealous. <laughs> Oh, I love Dave. Bless him, Dave. Oh, he is my love. Um, he just doesn't know it yet. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So basically, I don't know. Um, and what I've talked about it quite led to a lot of people. And my podcast is a very brief one because I don't have the patience of you lot. So mine's 10 minutes long and it's just a quick, quick chat about what I think. So even with this, even there, I, I haven't come to any conclusions that the, the vampires must have a circulatory system. Right. Because you are they are they're not breathing, but they're moving and they're walking and they're, you know, their joints are working. So clearly there's moisture inside their system. Otherwise, they would just dry up and creak or whatever. Yeah, uh, I've got I went through because Edward Cullen fascinates me on, at this level. Right. Because firstly, he's got razor sharp teeth. How is he not biting a face off by accident? <laughs> Um, secondly, the venom is in their saliva. How is if he's not, he, he, you know, from the very start when he's being a creepy night stalker in a bedroom window, you know, he's trying to kiss her, and so presumably it's not really dry and horrible. So, where's that coming from? But if there is moisture and fluids there, then presumably there's fluids everywhere else. How that makes one. See, I'm confusing myself as I'm talking about it because this is a really conf – I have put a lot of thought into this, <laughs> right, and and on a sheer fascinated level because if you've got um, an unchanging body at yeah. any level, so any, you know, any vampire, whether male or female, whatever, you know, the idea is that when they change, they – when they're converted, they don't change. Right. Um, and you're stuck at that point. Obviously, that doesn't always work. You look at poor David Bowie in The Hunger, you know, he, he suddenly becomes old. But generally, they are stuck in their heyday or they've been perfected by the, the change. They are also horny as anything. They're always <laughs> jumping on people. Um, we're going to ignore the Cullens at this point. That's this whole separate thing. because <laughs> they'd, they'd just be disgusted at this talk. So, but you you... Your, your true blood and things like that, you know, there's a lot of sex in it. They're, they're, they're getting it on a lot. Oh, yeah. um, so I, the only conclusion I've come to so far, um, and I will tell you in the same sentence as to why I think I, I've come to a ridiculous conclusion, is that possibly they can, the excitement, in the same as in a human, the excitement maybe wills, wills some of the bodily fluid or the blood or the whatever into the relevant parts of the body. Um, I'm assuming... It must be a natural reaction, the same as it would be in a in a human male, yeah. because otherwise, if you could just will as much as you wanted in there, I mean, you'd all be walking around blown up by mass, like massive balloons, wouldn't you? You'd be like a walking party trick, <laughs> and the, and you'd be dehydrating from the head down because you wouldn't be able to resist sending it all down there. So, so I can only assume that the blood moves around in the same way as it would in a human, um, and but. This is this is a bit graphic now. What comes out of it, I don't know because <laughs> Bella Swan gets pregnant, right? So something's happened there, hasn't it? So, yeah. so I don't know. I keep coming back to it being um, an enclosed system. The Victorians, because I've written a lot about Victorian sexuality, and the Victorians were very into the human body in general being a closed system which is why they were so dead against masturbation or whatever, because you were wasting your precious bodily fluids. And they literally thought you would desiccate if you did that too much. Hmm. So, uh, and and they they genuinely thought you would dry up and lose all your your strength. So, um, yeah, I, the answer is I don't know, because they they some of them seem to react like humans and behave like humans, but then others, as in a prime one, actually, was, was a BBC adaptation of Dracula last year um, with place bang playing the count and i absolutely love that version a lot of people didn't i absolutely adored it um and there is a scene in that which in any other movie would be a sex scene she's it's the, the modern equivalent to lucy western right she's sitting on his lap um and wriggling around and they're both having a marvelous time but they've got their clothes on all he's doing is biting her hmm. so whether some of them translate those urges to the feeding process instead 
Yeah. And maybe they're getting their pleasure from that. You know, maybe it's just like donuts only better. Maybe, maybe it's just like the undead delicious donuts. And, and Listen, that's you, you know it's bad for you, but you just can't resist. But you can't stop it. You know it's going to kill you eventually, but you can't stop it. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe. So the answer is I don't know. Well, tell me about, because we talked about, obviously, the male side of being a vampire, but you mentioned Camilla one time, and I have no idea what Camilla is. Oh, Camilla. She um, she is from 1872, off the top of my head. I might have got that date slightly wrong. Um, it's a story by Sheridan um, Le Fanu, Um, and Carmilla was a quite openly, to our eyes, it's, it's obvious, lesbian vampire, um, <clears throat> which really wasn't sort of the done thing in media and and stuff in, in the 1800s. Contrary to what a lot of people think, lesbianism has never been illegal in the UK. Homosexuality is, in, in applying to men, has been. Um, and was for a very long time but lesbianism never was and it's nothing to do with Queen Victoria um, everyone thinks it's because Queen Victoria wouldn't believe that people would do that sort of thing it's actually and, and I kid you not it is because the British government decided that if they mentioned it in law it might give women ideas right <laughs> so if they didn't mention it nobody would think to do it so that's why gay women have always been legal because the, the government thinks you can't, you haven't got a thought in your head and it, you're not going to think of it for yourself. So Carmilla was, she sort of slid under the radar, I suppose. She was quite clearly only after female victims. She was looking for um, company as much as anything, I think. But at the end of the day, she she was a deviant little cow who wanted to kill everything and get their money and their blood and, and all the rest of it. But yeah, Carmilla is just a short story from 1872. It's, it's, well worth reading it's easily readable even given the older sort of phrases in it it's very easily readable it's it, it's entertaining and it is a really good vampire story so yeah it's available it's um copyright free so you can get it download it onto kindles whatever anywhere now and you've talked before not necessarily the same type of story but another woman in these in these genres i never heard of lilith before adam's first wife and you brought her up yeah, Lilith. Well, Lilith had the suffered the fate of so many women who wouldn't do as they're told. She's probably why I like her so much. Um, Lilith was um, Adam's first wife. She was created equally from the same clay. They were equal. Um, but he, one, he and God, I presume they were in cahoots, expected her to be... Um, sorry, I'm not religious. I'm not remotely religious. I wouldn't ever... Um, I wouldn't have a mock religion, but I'm not personally religious, so I'm uh, I'm a little bit um, laissez-faire about it all. Right. So <laughs> she was um, she was created as Adam's equal, but was then expected to be subordinate to him. And Lilith, good girl as she was, refused. She refused to be subordinate because she was made equal and she thought she should be equal. So she was cast out of the Garden of Eden. And stories, and then Eve was made from Adam's rib, and he, she's come from him, so she is his subordinate, and that's why she, yeah. So that's where we're going with Lilith. So she, and Lilith was Adam's first wife. Um, and it didn't take long for Lilith. Oh, is that an amazing dog behind you? I don't know about amazing. It's a dog. Oh, dogs are brilliant. Mine are shut away because they're so noisy and they get into everything. Um, <laughs> so, so Lilith quite rapidly turns into old stories um, from from long, long, long centuries and centuries ago, um, quite quickly turns into this story of a baby killing monster, you know, that went out and just and got revenge by killing. But then it gets confusing because you've got Lamia as well, who because a lot of these old stories cross over and they come from each other and they get mixed up. And Lamia was this I'm doing from memory and I haven't read this one up again for a while. Lamia, so Zeus was married to Hera, Zeus the god, married yep. was his wife, whether they actually, not sure whether they did wedding bells in those days, but <laughs> because Zeus was a bit of a fuck boy, let's face it. So, yeah, so Zeus, um, his partner was Hera, but Lamia caught his eye. Zeus started getting it on with Lamia. Hera took offense at this um, and killed all Lamia's children and then plucked. Um, now, what did she do? Killed all Lamia's children and inflicted her with insomnia so she couldn't sleep and get any peace from it. Um, at which point Zeus, being the, such a caring boyfriend, 
took off her Lamia's eyelids so that she didn't have to sleep. So, or, or did she? Now, hang on, hang on. She, he may have given her remove, nah, removable eyeballs. I'm getting my myth mixed up here. I think he gave her the, the opportunity to remove her eyeballs at will. So, right. presumably, taking your eyes out means you stop thinking and you have a sleep. It's utterly fucked up. Um, it gives you such a you. It gives you such a peek into our perspective and the way we think as humans because obviously humans wrote these stories and the things Ooh. that obviously there's somebody thought of that like oh if i didn't like someone i would curse them with insomnia so they had to all yeah, I'd, I'd, their kill mistakes, their, you know? I'd kill their children and make them think about it for the rest of their lives it was yeah. pretty, pretty wicked you know what they're <laughs> thinking they, they didn't mess about did they the greeks so um so but she gets tied up into it as well uh and and then so lamia who is the one that's been hard done by really then turns into one that She's then going around killing people, specifically babies and children, and she, and and sucking their blood. And quite often, these old stories, and it's the same with the Astraea, um, from the Jewish Sefer Hasidim from the 13th century, are sucking blood through their hair. So the quite how this, they do this, I don't know. <laughs> but um, so the myths all start tangling up, and you can see this is almost early historical clickbait again because yeah. the stories are coming down through different cultures and different whatever and that, but the same ones are coming are popping up in different cultures just written slightly differently but quite often there are an awful lot where they are wronged women who are who get their revenge by killing children so and because that's the thing it, it's it, I suppose certainly back then it would be the easiest way to destroy a woman is to accuse her of killing children Oh yeah, you know, and and back then a lot of children would have died anyway, you know. So so, yeah, women are quite often turned into baby killer monsters, um, and that then starts turning into blood sucking and vampirism. So it, this goes back, you know, as far back as we've got written records. There are stories that that fit this sort of stuff. So. We talked earlier about, um, you know, the type of relationships and the men that you're drawn to. Is it is it normally the brooding, dark type that you are, are drawn to? Oh, my God. If you could see, if you could see a lineup of my exes. Um, oh, God, it's going to be so embarrassed now. If I if talk about I've got to be so careful about this talking on air. No, I, I, I'm actually dating, have been for a long time, a, a very funny very loud and sweary scouser now if you're not british you might not know what that means if you're british you do he's from liverpool okay. and has got a very very scarce accent and is an absolute gobshite and i adore him <laughs> um uh no um and he's brilliant but no absolutely not no okay. I, I go i've always just gone for people's personalities i like personalities i like people and i think that's why i like writing about history because i like people I've never had a type if i ever have a type with people it's unusual they've got to be a bit different yeah. you know I, I mean my chap now he he's amazing because he's an artist and a tattooist and and all sorts of stuff but is really 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 clever and that's what i like i like the fact that they'll talk about anything um and yeah i've always just dated people who can who are interesting so no and not davanian so i'm missing out aren't i what have i done wrong in my life never got dave well, and speaking of Dave and the Damned, I did notice on Spotify you have your own playlist. Is that something that you listen to often? I do. My God, I don't think anyone else has ever even seen that playlist. Um, I do have a vampire playlist. I do listen to it. Some of that actually came from um, writing this book. I decided to start doing a playlist to go with it. I, I Quite often, if I'm writing something, I'll put a playlist together as I'm doing it. Um, but I hadn't for ages. And I thought, oh, I know what I meant playlist because you know remember the days when people would make you a tape oh yeah you know, and send the burn cds like it was going out of style oh i mean yeah but i'm older than that you know we used to do cassette tapes and stuff <laughs> like, this this is yeah but burn cds yeah i've still got some that people have done for me over the years mm -hmm. and that's so cool and i really miss that and which is what i like about spotify you can kind of do your own mixtape so um yeah i do some of that playlist is stuff that was new to me and I was really pleased with it because I was asking around I asked on social media for ideas for that playlist um so some of it is stuff that I'd not listened to and I'd have missed out on it if I hadn't asked and found out um some of it is just stuff that I love I mean I'm old enough the, the cramps you know I grew up with the cramps yeah. and that's my, that's my favorite vamp fact I was telling somebody this on Twitter last night 
Ga um, in the Gary Oldman Dracula, when at the beginning, in the fanciful Coppola version, at the beginning where Gary's Vlad, is, his wife dies and he's screaming his betrayal in the church, he couldn't scream loud enough. So that screaming on, on the soundtrack of that is Lux Interior from The Cramps. Um, which if you, if anyone who knows who was Lux Interior, he's, he's died now. Um, it, it's just an amazing fact that, you know, it's Lux screaming on that movie. So, uh, yeah, I love stuff like that. And I like old rock and roll music as well, you know, as, as much as goth stuff. I'm not just into goth music. In fact, I'm probably not at all. I don't listen to new goth stuff. So, um, again, it's just, it's just something interesting. I'm at the moment playing a lot of medieval babes um because they do a lot of the old sort of pagan songs um and the wiccan type stuff because i like that it's akin to sort of medieval chanting and i like that in the background when i'm working because it's faintly mesmerizing but it doesn't distract yeah you know, I, I don't get if it's something i know really really well um that that i just play really loudly like nick cave nick cave's my absolute love actually um he's su superseded even dave vanian over the years um but if i play nick in the background then i start humming along to it or thinking about it or perhaps just thinking about nick cave to be honest um <laughs> i've got i've got a life-size nick cave in my downstairs loo and it shocks people when they go they're going for a pee and there's a full six foot two nick cave on on the wall which my friend ruth sent me because she's ace um so yeah, it, it, it's um, yeah, music's a big thing. Like I said, I started writing from from I just decided to have a go at writing a, a music fanzine when I was 24, I think 23, 24. I'd never done it before in my life um, and just just gave it a go. And it did all right. You know, I just did it for a bit, got bored and some, did something else because that's how I've done, done things over the years. But yeah, no. Um, so, yeah, music. I love music. I like all sorts of interesting stuff. But I'm not tied to one thing, and men have just got to be clever. Now, our next taboo subject: Twilight. And I, uh, you know, don't want to get too bogged down in the weeds because I still want to get to the fun stuff and that. But yeah. I will, I will put a teaser up for people listening. Violet has a video on YouTube called "Is Twilight Racist?" that everyone should go check out. It's a good one. But as far as Twilight and the sort of vampire community goes. Did you have you from people you've talked to or from your own experiences? Was there a noticeable shift in the vampire community pre and post Twilight? Well, firstly, there isn't a vampire community. It, okay. it, you know, it, there there isn't. It, it's people. Plenty of people like them, or they don't. And some people like them and are massively goth, and some aren't. You know, um, Twilight did bring in a lot of younger people, and I I don't I think that's a good thing. And I I do have to keep making this very clear. I don't hate Twilight. I insist on the right to shred it because there are some things that are massively wrong with that series, massively. Um, but for sparkly, easy watching or listening fun, it, it can't be beaten. I own all the books. I've got all the DVDs. You know, I went to watch all of the movies as soon as they came out. In fact, what I used to do was take my eldest son out of school and tell everybody I was taking him. And um, I used to spring him out of school and we go together. So, um <laughs> So it was a massive sort of renaissance in it. It was. But I think the good thing that came out of it is a lot of people um, started thinking about sort of fantasy stories again and urban fantasy things, um, which, I mean, we we already you've got things like The Hunger Games and whatever, which are, you know, your sort of young adult urban fantasies anyway. But it, it got people back into sort of the fantastical you know, um, your wolves and your werewolves and your 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 vampires because we'd have wizards. You know, you've got all your wizards, but I like the people that are really different because you know Harry Potter. I never got into Harry Potter. I don't know why, but I should, uh, I think it just isn't sexy enough. I think that's my problem. I have to, things have to be sexy, and Harry isn't. Sorry, Harry. And um, although if you've seen Daniel Radcliffe recently, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, no, no, Twilight was a massive thing. It was a really good thing. It's brought loads of people into reading the genres that have then moved on to other stuff. Um, I'd never, never knock it. I would knock some of its ethics and its and its morality because I think it is too, too deeply rooted in religion and religion mm. and its 
sexist and misogynistic. That doesn't mean it can't be a really entertaining watch because I, I love it despite its faults, not because of it. Right. I, I, lo I belong to a Facebook group called Twilight um, Sewer Posting. And if anyone doesn't know it, they need to join it because everybody in that group, there are thousands and thousands of people and everybody in that group hates it as much as they love it. And they spend way too much of their time putting together the cleverest memes you have ever seen, just absolutely shredding the entire series. They are my favorite people on the internet. I absolutely love them. Um, and, but, but that's the, the joy of it. It brought people in. And then I, I do know from other people, a lot of people went from that to things like true blood, you know, um, and blade because, people were growing up with twilight and then going into the other ones and then a lot of people then go back to the old school stuff and look at interview with a vampire you know which is the classic although louis needs a kick up the jacks i swear to god he's so wet um so yeah no it, it i think it's a good thing i think it's a good thing i think unfortunately that it's spawned 50 shades but you can't <laughs> have everything in life and to be fair i Again, confession again, I, I wrote fan fiction for a bit and then I went into writing erotica and did quite well at it. I, I used to write erotica for, for a publisher. Um, and actually, had I been E.L. James, who wrote that just on a fan fiction website to start with, and I've got the, the original file because when she first wrote Fifty Shades, it was a Twilight story and it was it's all the Twilight characters. And that's the weird thing. Um so I've got the original file of that and an original copy of when it is still all the characters from Twilight really getting it on down and dirty, you know, and it's so disconcerting. It's unreal. But and then she had to change the names and the details in order to be able to publish this book, because obviously it was copyright and bordering on offensive. So right. she changed. And had that happened to me, had I written something and somebody's gone, actually, we'll give you five million dollars if you change the names. Of course, I'd have taken it. I don't care how terrible it had been. You know, I wouldn't care if you all thought I was the worst person in the world for the rest of my life. I've got millions of dollars. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I've written a fun story and made millions off it. Yeah, I'd, I'd be like a ferret down a rabbit hole, I would have been. So I know you're expected to skew a certain way, but in real life, did you find Robert Pattinson or Taylor Laudner more attractive? Oh, God, don't ask me this. Dear God. Um <laughs> No, neither of them neither <laughs> of them i'd have dated her uh, dad okay i'd have dated charlie there you go because Char because charlie's a nice bloke charlie firstly <laughs> i'm 52 nearly so you know i am not the age to be fancying robert pattinson um so charlie i i actually really really billy burke jacob's dad he's hot as um <laughs> he, 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 honestly i'm i'm middle-aged woman i'm sorry hey. but, um no because edward is a gaslighting manipulative little shit and, and jacob is just creepy he's just creepy he's you know he's following around he's obsessing over and then he turns out he wants to marry a baby <laughs> uh, just no i mean i can see as a writer i can see how she got herself into that corner and then had to do something with it and you've got to try and make it as least ick as you can once you've got to that stage so i can see how she's ended up doing it mm -hmm. pretty sure i just spiked that book and rewritten that you know and and just check or i'd have had renesme which is the worst name ever i'd have had that baby grow up really quick so she was a teenager and she could make her own decisions maybe you know, but then I'm not here to say how I'd have rewritten Twilight because I didn't. She did. So there you go. Do any of the other like monster uh, sighting stories get your interest at all? Anything like Bigfoot, aliens? Are you interested at all in those sorts of aliens, things? Aliens. Okay. Definitely into aliens. Aliens. I'm pretty sure. Oh God, I'm going to sound absolutely batshit here. I'm pretty sure humanity could well have been an alien mistake. It doesn't mean I don't believe in evolution because I do. Um, yeah. But I think we we maybe um, were dropped here and then evolved because we were dumped by the aliens. I think we're just terrible people. The aliens decided, you know, a higher force exists somewhere else, and we are the ones that went wrong and we got dumped. Um, and and I'm sure we evolved. And this does make me sound utterly mad. I'm not convinced. No, it's it's telling a similar story to when Neil deGrasse Tyson says that uh, a, a rock from Mars could have landed on Earth back in the day and some sort of Martian bacteria spawned us from there. So yeah, that, that's the thing. And that's that's more like what I think. I don't, I, I don't you know, so, so it could have happened genuinely, scientifically and accidentally. 
I like to run with the idea that we are the bastard offspring of an alien race who is far better and are just horrified at their mistake and they've just dumped us, you know, <laughs> or or dumped us millennia ago and we've developed from there. I certainly I agree with evolution. Yeah. I don't think you can disagree with that. Um, but I don't think we came necessarily from here. I think digressitized maybe is right in that we've come from something else originally. I mean, they do think there maybe has been life on Mars at some point, don't they? So maybe we're a, a shard of that that's landed and gone. I mean, we're probably the worst in the universe anyway, aren't we? Seems but, like it. You know. Seems like we're the only ones actively destroying the planet. I think they're just hiding from us. I think that's why we haven't seen any. They're hiding yeah. from us. Well, this was the perfect transition to the last thing I wanted to talk about before our games. Uh, mm. You on the Messy Podcast were talking about a particular sex toy you had to deal with uh, <gasps> that was an alien. And it I wasn't knew just... somebody had asked me about this. I knew, <laughs> I thought we'd forgotten the alien dildo. Um, Please explain. Not he's not here if i'd have known if i'd have known i'd have brought him up to this desk so you could have seen him All right um brogoth yeah so this is what i'm saying about the, the weird stuff i did for metro because they <laughs> rapidly realized that i'd got no filters and i would just write about anything so there's this thing um for called the overpositor people get off on um pretending they're inseminated with alien eggs so there's a company called Primal Hardware in the States, over in the States, which make them the most amazing things. I mean, the, the sculptures they do are just fantastic. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just terrifying, some of them. But they got on board with this and they agreed to send me one of their um, alien overpositors. And, um, oh, my God, this thing turned up in a box and it's just hilarious. It's called Brogoth. And it sits on my other desk, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd show it to you. And, um, it, it, you know, he, it, I, the, the jealousy has been washed off. He's all right. He's cool. And um, But what I didn't realise was that you were supposed to make your own eggs. Yeah. I assumed that something like this came with, like, fake jelly eggs or something. And um, it doesn't. So what they'd sent me was a load of sachets of Kraft beef gelatin. So my kitchen stunk of beef for days it just it felt it melted through the bottom of the, the the mold and it went all over the kitchen and i just smelled of pork pies for days on end um so yeah you have to make your own jelly eggs in this mold it's, there's a lot of faff i mean this is more than foreplay you, you need 48 hours of kitchen play before you can <laughs> do anything with an overposter and these days actually you can buy fake ones which is is a good move so um yeah, you had to mix gelatin. So I spent a Saturday afternoon with my kids. Luckily, my kids are in their teens and 20s. Um, wondering why mum was tipping gelatin into egg moulds. Um, it, it was just the weirdest thing. So basically, yeah, it, it's like a giant silicon flexible alien dong <laughs> with a hole in the middle. And it comes with a pusher to push these gelatin eggs in. Uh, it doesn't smell... the the. Craftsmanship in it is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I can quite <laughs> see why people love them. Not for me, apart from anything else. I'm vegetarian these days, so I'd have to go and find some vegan gelatin or whatever. So, um, but yeah, I did not expect to to write sex toy reviews, but end up stinking of pork pies. Well, and it's so fascinating to me that it's not enough to use the toy to insert it, you know, into yourself, but you need the the insemination, you know, that's yeah. what really gets some people off. Do you know what? Yeah. There's nothing sexy about it. There's nothing <laughs> sexy about it because quite understandably, I don't think it would surprise anyone to know that when I was having to try this thing out, I did it on my own. I didn't want anyone seeing the gelatin. Nobody needs to see this gelatin. So, um, and I was just sort of looking at it for ages and trying to figure out how to squeeze it. And then one of them popped across the room and it hit the carpet. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, man. Um, so no, no, aliens, not for me. I, they're, they're welcome to come down and take over this forsaken planet. But yeah, and, and unless they look like, you know, Nick Cave or Dave Vaney, and I won't be getting it on with them, though. Well, and you said also that, uh, you know, there's like the size of hen's eggs, which I was like, oh, boy. And also that the reason you couldn't use like a fruit jelly is because of yeast balance, which is crazy. absolutely. Yeah. No, this is this is yeah handy sex tips with Violet here, here and now. Right. Don't ever use sugar-based jellies for any of this stuff. People get down because I I worked for a sex toy wholesaler for a while, and I've I still write a monthly column for the UK's um, 
sex trade industry magazine to this day. Um, it's a history column now because oh. it would be, but it's about sexual it's about sexual history. But I but I was a sex toy reviewer for a long time because I said I'll I'll give anything a go and it's funny. Um, so and it's the best industry ever to work in. It's full of the nicest people you could ever meet because they're so open and accepting because they have to be in in that world. Um, but yeah, it's um, it, it's just weird it's that sometimes some things are just a step too far just just giant size eggs squidging it it's not sexy you've got to get into a weird position you're pinging them across the room no i mean maybe if if nick cave dressed in a silver space suit and wanted to give it a go i'd perhaps try it again but even then i think i'd have to put a mask on so i wouldn't have to look at anybody well i appreciate you humoring me and talking about it now i have a great uh idea for an anniversary gift next year <laughs> Yeah, she might divorce you. <laughs> so let's get into game time. Go on. Are you familiar with the game Fuck, Mary Kill? Yes. So we are going to play Fuck, Mary Kill with vampire movies. Oh, God. Right. Okay. So your first three, Fuck, Mary Kill, Blade, Underworld, and Van Helsing. Oh, Underworld. Are we talking Celine here? Yes. Fuck Mary Kill. Blade. Fuck Celine. Absolutely. She's hot as. Marry Blade because you know he'd look after you, wouldn't he? He'd do his best and he'd look after you and kill Van Helsing because he's an absolute buzzkill. No, <laughs> we're getting rid of Van Helsing. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Celine, Blade, Van Helsing, that order. Okay. Next set we have and final set Queen of the Damned, Interview with the Vampire. And the Lost Boys. Oh my God! Um, oh, that's really difficult. That is actually really difficult. Queen of the Damned. Interview the Vampire. Lost Boys. Right. Okay. Fuck Queen of the Damned. Hot. Um, just because aesthetics, everything you know, glorious, <laughs> glorious. You'd go with Queen of the Damned. Anybody would, wouldn't they? Um, Mary. Oh, Lost Boys. I'd go and live in the cave with them. I'd go in there, they're so cool, you know, and they, they've got the doors and they're playing Echo and the Bunnymen, which over that movie, which is one of my favourite songs ever. The fact that, and I write about that, but the fact that you've got, you know, a, a band from Liverpool, that a song from the 80s over that movie is, is just one of my favourite things ever. So, um, so yeah, fuck Queen of the Damned, married all of the Lost Boys, thank you, all of them, I'm not, I'm not picking. And <laughs> um, we'll kill Interview with the Vampire because, honest to God, um, Lestat, is just a brat. I mean, it'd be huge fun. It'd be huge fun. if you had to spend eternity with one. Then, then the start because he doesn't care, does he? You just get on with it. Louis, I'd throttle within the first week. I'd stab him with his own fangs because he whines. I know he's got a tragic backstory, but he's such a whiner. So yeah, no, we'll we'll kill off we'll kill off interview with the vampire, and I'll go and live with the lost boys. Okay, perfect. Next game we have is I'm going to give you a set of names. And you're going to tell me the percentage chance that they are indeed a vampire. <laughs> so we are going to start with Queen Elizabeth. Our current queen. Yes. Not the first one. Yes. Right. Okay. Is she a vampire? No, she's a lizard. Next zero, zero percent lizard. What is the percent chance that Ozzy Osbourne is a vampire? Oh, God. 99.9. Yeah, I love Ozzy. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Boris Johnson. Oh, actually, that's a difficult one because I don't think he's nice enough to be a lizard. Uh, a lizard? Oh, I'm stuck on lizards now. Um, I don't think he's nice enough to be a vampire. Um, he, I'm going to give him 30% vampire because he might be one of the terrible vampires. Okay. He might just be one of the horrible vampires. Okay. Yeah, he's not a nice one. He's a horrible one. And we're going to wrap it up with Meghan Markle. Oh, I love Meghan. Um, Meghan's cool. Right. Um, is Meghan Markle, Markle a vampire? I hope so, because <laughs> she'll outlive the rest of them, won't she? <laughs> so I'm going to give her a solid, encouraging 85%. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. Well, that finishes up the games. Thank you so much. I wanted to read you a quote and get your reaction to it. 
Quote, Fenn's writing is so readable and it's clear this is a book written by a historian who loves her subject and is very knowledgeable about the research being carried out by other historians from Gesticulates. How does that make you feel? That's amazing. I've not heard that one. Where's that from? Gesticulates. I found it. I don't know that. Yeah. Um, I've not read that. That's oh, that that's amazing. That's absolutely made my day. Um, and I'm really pleased that it comes across because I do. I try to write books that are accessible. I, I you know, I and I'm, I'm not an historian. I, I'm an enthusiast, and that's what I'd always say to people. I've ended up sort of being seen as something as of a historian by default because I write history books. But um, I'm an enthusiast and. I really like my subject matter. I like the people in it. I've got a book about the Regency coming out next year, so, uh, Secrets and Scandals in the Regency. And I've purposely gone with that one for people that are the outsiders and a bit mar. Well, some of them are, you know, we've got Byron and all sorts in it, but I've gone for the marginalised angles of them. Do you know what I mean? Why I like them. Um, and that's, no, that's amazing because, yeah, nobody can do anything like this without, re without going by what other people have already written and read um or made into movies or whatever um but just just anything do you know what i've always said if any of my books makes one person happy honestly i mean obviously i'd like my publishers to make some money so they keep paying me to make more books that would be great as well but um if it just gives somebody something to read that they just really enjoy if they can enjoy reading as much as i used to when i was a kid when i found the odd book that my dad had rooted out you know that was that was really cool then, then that's enough for me. But yeah, no, that I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled. Thank you so much. Absolutely, and I would encourage everyone to please find a history of the vampire in popular culture. Love at first bite. You also have another book, Sex and Sexuality in Victorian Britain, and you are working on another book. Yes, I am. I've got um, Secrets and Scandals in um, Regency. But I had to. Rem I've got so. I've done. I've written all of these in the past two and a half years. So it's, it's three and a half years so it, it's all falling in on one at the moment um yeah um sex drugs and proxy rule um secrets and scandals in regency britain that comes out next year um and i'm also at the moment i'm actually i'm actually writing fiction now at, at this precise moment in time i'm writing my own urban fantasy so it's still being written so we'll see what happens with that one. But yeah yeah no please it's available on kindle it's available in pretty much every country i think um, but yeah, the vampires is my baby. You know, that's my thing. That's the one I've always wanted to write. And, and I'm so thrilled to have had the opportunity and to just talk to people about it. Just the fact that, you know, you'll have me on and just chat about it for an hour or so. It's just amazing to me. Oh, so, please. Uh, the pleasure was all mine. And I also would encourage everyone to go to Sex, Death, Rock and Roll, where they can find your work. They can also find the Skull Illusion archives there. Yes. They can, and they can yeah. find my T-shirt shop where I set, I I've got a T-mail store where I sell T-shirts with such legends as Byron was a fuck boy, um, and and it also comes in Rossetti flavor um, and stuff like that. So I've, there's a little bit of everything on there. But and and yeah, and if anyone ever wants to contact me or ask me things, or I'm on Twitter as Violet Fenn on Twitter um, and Instagram the same. But if anyone wants to ask me anything, just get in touch. There's a contact thing on my website or tweet me or whatever but i'll chat to anybody about vampires and i'm more than happy to do so excellent well miss ben violet thank you so much for your time i i can't thank you enough i really appreciate it and hope you have a happy halloween thank you very much have a fabulous time and thank you so much for inviting me on thank you very much enjoy the rest of your weekend cheers and you bye